Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. And starting this event, I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered on the traditional, ancestral, and stolen territory of the Kosovish peoples, Spanish, Mesquia, and Suewa two nations. And I say stolen because if we were convinced by colonial capitalist economic strategies that is possible to claim and own land, then we were scammed by a, an oppressive strategy that puts body after body, identity against identity, worker against worker, one generation after the other. I invite us all to think that it was 1899, only 123 years ago, when we call the closure of the map, meaning that the year when the last bit of earth left unclaimed was stolen by a state nation. There is a recent aggression and entitlement that has shaped our history and for sure the history of our families. I also invite us to reflect on what it means to live within colonial capitalist structures in our relationship with class consciousness, land owning, identity politics, and decolonizing knowledge. If stories are all we are, decolonizing spaces and ideas can be the zeitgeist of our generation as it seems to be the spirit that moves our time and our ethical task throughout life and between each other as we enter, live, build, and change communities. This is why we say that messy art is a space by and for over-excluded artists, to recognize that there is a scheme of silences and voids of thought that enables us, the people, to deeply discuss and understand the narratives that have built this place that we commonly and colonially call North America. Tonight, Messy Art Society, Messy Books, and Coach House Books welcome our audience for the launch of Falling Hour by Jeffrey D. Morrison. Morrison will be joined by editor and writer Marisa Brzezenko in an evening that invites us to examine how thought itself is a lens and how it may be communicated in writing. This project has been made possible by the government of Canada, and I remind attendees that copies of the Falling Hour are available at the front desk. And now, please welcome Marisa Grzenko. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Um, thanks for coming. Um, I read Jeffrey's book. Something like that in the summer, an advanced copy, and really thought it was amazing. And so the fact that I get to be here today in conversation with him is really an honor. Um, I just want to thank Massey Arts for providing an essential community space in which to share ideas and celebrate beauty and imagine futures of different possibilities. And thank you also to Coach House, uh, one of my favorite independent publishers, for publishing books that are innovative, adventurous, thought provoking, and always beautiful. Thank you for this beautiful thing of art. Um, Christiana Gunner is unfortunately wasn't able to join us tonight, how we noticed, uh, but I would encourage you to buy her book, um, The Scent of Life, it's a collection of five novellas, a really, really beautiful, smart, published between eight, 1989 and 1998, I think, um, yeah, they're really wonderful, and I'm hoping kind of her spirit is here tonight, um, we have some questions that maybe we can talk about some of the commonalities between Jeffrey and Christiana's work. And yeah, so the way the night will go is that I'll just introduce Jeffrey and a brief to us from his book, and then we'll kind of have some conversation. And if anyone has any questions, we can open it up, and then there'll be some mingling and book buying, perhaps, what we don't want to. So Jeffrey D. Morrison is a fiction writer, poet, and critic. He's the author of the poetry chapbook Blood Brain Barrier, published by Frog Hollow Press in 2019 and co-author with Matthew Tomkinson of the experimental short fiction collection Archaic Torso of Gumby, published by Gordon Hill Press in 2020. His work has appeared in Grain, Prism, The Malahat Review, The Thames Review, Shrapnel, The Rusty Tooth, and elsewhere. He was a finalist in both the poetry and film fiction categories of the 2020 Malahat Review Open Season Awards, and a nominee for the 2020 Journey Prize. Falling Hour is his debut novel. Jeffrey lives on unceded Squamish, Musqueam, and Silvatooth territory. All 
Can you can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, well, first of all, thank you so much for coming. Um, it was so lovely of you all to do that. It really means a lot. Um, thank you so much to Marissa for being a fantastic host. Thank you so much to Massey Books, Massey Art Society, for all the hard work you do. It really also means a huge amount. Um, I also really want to encourage people. So this is Christiana's book, The Scent of Life. It's so beautiful. It's such a shame that she couldn't be here with us tonight. I really, really admire this book. I really urge people to check it out. Um, so I wanted to bring it up here with my little plug here. Um, okay. So I guess I should get to the reading. Um, I should set this up a little bit. So this is a book where not very many things actually happen. <laughs> um, so it's hard to set it up in a normal way, but I'll do my best. Um, we have a character called Hugh Delgarno. Happens to be my grandmother's maiden name. Um, and Hugh is in a town that goes entirely unnamed, but it's somewhere in southwestern Ontario, and it's basically London, Ontario. Um, but the fire hydrants are a different color, so I strayed a little bit from reality there. Um, but he's in this town, uh, and he lives alone, and he finds a picture frame in the street that he um, has arranged to give to someone um, that he has met on the internet. Um, and he goes to this park. No one else is in the park. He's waiting for the person to arrive. Much later on in the book, it becomes very clear this person's never gonna arrive. Um, but at the time that I'm gonna read from, he's still actually kind of waiting and there's like a possibility this person may show up. Um, so that's where we're at, we're chapter three for this first part. Okay. I was still waiting, by the way. The drops on the frame ran slickly down the ziggurat without trailing wetness behind them or sinking down into the wood. It seemed sealed up in good varnish. And in fact, the more I examined the uniform cuts without error, the sturdiness of the real wood, the more I believed it had once been expensive and that it had once also housed something at great price. Not a poster, a diploma, a photograph, a painting, I was certain now. And knowing the tastes of the few rich people in this town, most likely a terrible painting, something abstract in pastels or earth tones, a piece of hospital art, no more interesting to look at or think about than a stain on a kitchen counter or less even, because a stain is at least a spontaneous miracle of nature. With the subtext, of course, that its owner could afford to spend thousands of dollars on something so bad, so that if they so chose, they could instead of put that money in small bill form and blown it all over the main street of the town with a leaf blower without feeling the slightest fiscal pinch but with the further subtext that they would never do anything so philanthropic as that, even that small and patronizing gesture for the people of the town, a suffering inland post-industrial town like so many others, and that they would instead lock up that money forever in a rose and mauve and amber canvas called Wichita Sunrise, steadily appreciated, signifying nothing. It was their special way of saying fuck you to the people of the town. I felt proud to be reselling the frame for so little money. And I felt even prouder of the kids who I imagined had found or stolen it in the first place and slung it around a hydrant in a lower middle-class neighborhood. I like to think they had been saying fuck you right back, but they may just have thought it was funny. The varnish caught hold of the light so that the grass in the empty center of the frame was bordered by the sun, or rather its residue, the trace of its slow explosion in the distance, its quiet explosion, as I said before, the residue of sun and the skin of ice. I had not picked this phrase, a skin of ice, by accident. I had in fact been using it in my mind these last few months to describe a phenomenon perhaps related to my broken brain. But if so, a relation whose precise causal order was yet unclear to me. I was not sure if the skin of ice was a symptom or a sign 
or the source of the symptoms, or a warning of something worse to come. Perhaps even a something worse to come related to wherever it is I am now. But I tended to think this phenomenon was most like a fever, an effort from some other zone of my body to hush the worst effects of my broken brain. And like a fever, an effort that in the short term just made me feel worse. I had only vague names for the phenomenon. Vagueness appeared to be part of what it was. But the image I kept returning to when I felt this way was that I was sealed in a skin of ice. I could move, but stiffly and at a delay. I could feel, but faintly, as though my nerve endings had been burned away by frost. I could see, but with the soft ocular warp of something clear yet imperfect in front of my eyes. I once had a dream that I went to my regular coffee shop in town and didn't say anything. I just stood in front of the woman at the counter, my mind and face blank, making no gestures, as if any thought or sound or movement would have been enough to destroy me utterly. And yet the coffee appeared, and the woman at the counter coached me through an uncooperative debit machine, and I woke up feeling like I had passed through the eye of a needle. The skin of ice was like this, a brutal protective magic that got me through the day at the cost of everything it deemed unnecessary, up to and including thought and language. An airtight seal ensuring I gave as little as possible to the world. On balance, it seemed most like a fever. I wondered if I would feel it when the stranger came for the frame, if I would hand over the item and take the money but say almost nothing. Any minute now, I thought. In the meantime, a snail had appeared from somewhere dark and cool in the pebbled soil under the leaves of grass and started to climb the steps of the ziggurat like a Babylonian priest ascending to observe the heavens in a purple robe. I did not mind that it was on the frame. Once it had finished what it meant to do, I could wipe away its trail with my thumb and not tell the stranger about it. Many people are particular about things like this, but I am not. As I see it, the species with the greatest ability to contaminate what it touches is ours. The trace of the snail on the frame was a thin band of silver, and I thought of the stream in the ditch on the day I first saw a red-winged blackbird. Only the snail's silver was beamier, a stream in the light of a rising moon. So that when I watched the snail on the frame, I was watching the slow advance of moonlight across the steps of a temple, the shining steps of a temple catching in its unfinished stones the slow explosion of the sun, the temple at the wild outer shore of the hesitating sea of green bright blades. The leaves of the tree above me shook in the hot wind and a single leaf detached and fell to the ground seesaw style. Everything was exploding and everything that was not exploding was falling down. Walking is falling forward, I read once. Our biped movement, just a guided fall of odd deliberateness, like the demolition of a condemned building. Slow falling powered by controlled explosion. And this seemed true at either end of cosmic scales of size, complexity, and time. Millions of big and small metabolic systems and reactions and ab reactions and chain reactions and dominoes. So that the snail was exploding as surely as I was, and the grass and the sun, and even the moon has a molten core for all its outward aspect of inertia. Because it was mostly dead matter, I was not quite sure the frame was exploding all that much. Though once I heard that wood never dies. In any case, it was falling as the world was. The snail kept climbing. Its ruffles, the gray, the color of tide-soaked sand, were pitted like dinosaur skin, and they billowed in slow motion, caught at the face of each oncoming step like a damp tablecloth flung outward. Its horns stretched and dipped like cantilevers as it moved. My eyes fixed above all on its shell, the way it twisted like a shepherd's crook in the Book of Kells, 
One twist of dark mahogany and the other complementary band of honey white yellow at the tight nucleus. The yellow of watercolor daffodils. Yellow bleaching out steadily as the coil unwound, ending at the opening in an ivory or papyrus off white. A marble. This cold gray blanket, again, I thought, was alive and it lived inside itself in a brittle Fibonacci sequence, smoother inside than almost anything a human hand could make except for plastic, which was after all just a distillation of very old shells. I knew that snails were male and female at the same time, that in their mating, they impregnated their partners and were impregnated by them in turn. And the symmetry of this was beautiful to me. Not least because whatever the observer would think about me from my appearance, the world I inhabited inside myself was male, female, and neither all at once. And had been so at least since adolescence. And so the world inside the coils of self I carried with me had felt like an open world. If in many ways also a secret world. And also a world that I myself could hardly understand. When I was 15 or 16, I saw a picture of a young shirtless Javier Bardem in a newspaper review of the Spanish film The Sea Inside and felt the beginnings of what I now recognize to have been a crush. And it is perhaps for that reason, as well as for the poetry of the title, poetry I was drawn to naturally as I grew up along the coasts and the estuaries, that the words The Sea Inside remained with me and became an image I could use for the world inside myself. Even as I continued to never see the film, or learn why it had been titled that way. This inner open world was a dark sea, a warm sea, a salt sea I still knew only a corner of, could map its currents by only the broadest drifts and streams. The dark sea of myself existed in unclear relation to my brain and its brokenness. Was my brain the sea, or a vessel on this sea, or the navigator in the cabin, or her instruments? Or was my brain the wind and rain and bitter cross currents that churned the sea's surface like a fearsome avenging hand? I did not know then in the park. Wherever it is I am now, I continue not to know. Quote, the Scotchman has made up his mind within himself in a sort of snail shell wisdom. The Irishman is full of strong headed instinct, end quote. So says Keats as part of a long passage about the difference between Scottish and Irish people in another one of his letters to Tom from his travels. The passage is about as bad as you would expect. I never said I loved the man who haunted me. And in fact, I mostly hate the Keats of these letters, who sounds like any other nightmare English tourist to a place that is not England, bitching about the poor quality of the food, moaning about the shabbiness of the lodgings, always trying to get in a dig about the people who clatter or gabble away in Gallic in the rooms adjacent to his. At times, he looks at the world with the eyes of a wretched colonial administrator, weighing and measuring the character traits of the Scottish and Irish peasantry to see how far they might be improved and refined. He was by no means the first. The open secret of each of the modern period's transoceanic empires certainly in the bloody two centuries after Keats' letter, and just as certainly in the bloody three centuries before, is that they practiced their demonic instruments close to home first, Spain to the conversos and mariscos, France to the Cathars of Languedoc, England to Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. What had Louis Riel written to the Irish-American paper, The Irish World in 1885? Quote, in their treatment of us, however, the behavior of the English is not singular. Follow those pirates the world over and you will find that everywhere and at all times, they adopt the same tactics and operate on the same thievish lines. Ireland, India, the highlands of Scotland, Australia, and the isles of the Indian Ocean. All these countries are the sad evidences and their native populations are the witnesses of England's land robberies, end quote. In their own private way, the condescending letters from Keats are incident reports, white papers, intelligence gatherings on behalf of the pirates of the world, 
He's looking at Ireland and the highlands of Scotland with a pirate's eyes. Even if he fantasizes the next year about joining Simon Bolivar's army of liberation in South America, and even if by some accounts his great poem to Autumn is in secret about the pitiless redcoats descending upon the Manchester weavers of Peterloo, so that the man who haunts me is my enemy at the same time that he haunts me, and at the same time that he has written poems that have served the continuation of my life, I see no contradiction. It may all be put to use. The snail shell wisdom he observes in the rural poor of Scotland is a part of his larger view of these people as grave, serious, cautious, stubborn, introverted, and self-contained. Superficiality is all, but not from nothing. Keats, without knowing it, was observing the effects of a bone-deep cultural Calvinism, of rural poverty, of subsistence-based tenant farming. Of course, you would be circumspect with the Kirk and the landlord breathing down your neck all the time. And the trace of these things seemed long. My great uncle was descended from ex tenant farmers and crofters and farm laborers in Aberdeenshire. My great aunt, the product of stone cutters and wool spinners and mill workers in the city proper. While as secular socialists, they had firmly rejected the Kirk and all that it stood for. A certain tiny moat of its forms had burrowed into them, burrowed into them all the same and reproduced itself. So that by the time they emigrated in the mid thirties, they were hauling the weight of centuries across the ocean and not their own mere decades. If this makes any sense, they repudiated Calvinism in a Calvinist way. Their attacks took on the contours of their targets. And so by extension, and with all the distortions that came from ostensibly growing up on the west coast of Canada in the 1990s, with the Simpsons, Calvin and Hobbes, Age of Empires II, Rowdy Roddy Piper, about 500 illustrated nonfiction science and history books from the library, and Sharif Abdurrahim's Vancouver Grizzlies, I too acquired by osmosis my own attenuated version of the snail shell wisdom. From childhood, I have tended to get stuck within the spirals in my own head. Okay, so um, other context that I should have added, I think the great aunt and great uncle character um, are his guardians. He was born in Aberdeen, but he grows up in Canada. He's much older people that raised him. Okay, next passage. Um, this is, if you're following along, um, starting on page 134. Um, at this point in the book, it's really clear the stranger is never coming. Um, it's uh, unclear how much time has passed even. It's starting to get really kind of metaphysically weird. Um, and uh, it comes at a time when he was thinking about forgetting and forgetfulness. And he has this idea that forgetting is like the prevailing condition of life now. Like we're constantly forgetting things. Um, so this starts on page 134. Okay. I felt like a slot machine. The levers pulled and the wheels turned, and the rebus of cherries and lemons and coins was each time remade. I began again in forgetfulness, and with the feeling of the world and forms around me as new. No, not new. Not the new in its shock or exhilaration. And the world and forms did not imprint themselves upon my brain with the special seal of the new. Rather, old forms assembled in new ways, or rather, old forms assembled in old ways that in my forgetfulness I deemed new, but only the new of the old, not the truly new. I thought of the cherry blossoms back home. Many times you could walk down whole streets planted with nothing other than cherry trees white blossoms or pink blossoms or both pink or white clouds reaching up to the telephone wires hanging slack over the streets or crowding over the roofs to walk these streets in the weeks of mid-march was to walk through a perfect dream image of japan a dream japan transposed onto another place as if one color transparency were laid upon another but this world no sooner was no sooner begun than I would go back inside, think about other things, sleep, wake up, 
and go out again into another world completely different and just begun. The new world of blossoms blowing from the trees in a constant pink white snow falling almost horizontal on the wind. And this was as much a revelation to me in the street that I forgot the day before. The dream image of perfect Japan and saw instead the surreal and melancholy pink white snow only as if it were almost the first thing I had seen in my life. I would go inside again and read and think. I would drink tea or beer. Sunset would come later than before and I would turn my light on later than before. I would sleep and forget. Whole days might go by and forgetting to think about cherry trees or perhaps only one day. When I next walked on the street, I would see a world that in its newness obliterated all memory of the world before. Or perhaps I had it the wrong way around. Perhaps forgetfulness came first. Already, even as I write about forgetfulness, I forget. When I began, did I mean to say one thing or the other? Perhaps I meant to say a version of both. But the world I saw, in any case, felt new, and I forgot the world before. This world was in its own way a great, an incredible revelation. Now the petals are mostly on the ground on the tops of mailboxes, on the roofs of cars. Because of my forgetfulness, I could not say that the previous world of the pink white snow had caused this new world of petals on the ground. I had forgotten that world. And the world of the transparency of the dream Japan was gone as well. The transparency itself off the page and put away in a drawer, leaving nothing of itself behind. It bathed in the waters of today's world only. The petals lined the sidewalks like an opulent votive carpet in a festival. Every car was a wedding car. This too was a new and incredible world. And yet the creep of some new doubt or lack of ease arose in me the more I walked down streets where some great ceremony appeared to have happened without me. I was late, I was lost, I was missing. At the edges of the carpets of the petals, I saw the tea brown rock that all would come to. I remember that I had forgotten, that I had done so again and again. And I remembered as though the transparency thought missing turned up again at the bottom of a seldom open drawer, the dream Japan. And I knew that in the Japan that was not the dream of a distant and ignorant amnesiac such as myself, the cherry blossom was the object of centuries of poetry, of festival, of painting, and that the theme of so much of this reflection on the cherry blossom had been lost, the ephemeral, the incredible and self-destroying rupture that would change the world and then erase itself, and that I had begun again in forgetting. I had forgotten again and again in the evenings when I lay on my bed or the small couch I had found at the St. Vincent de Paul shop and read books with rhythmic prose, books I felt a kinship with and wanted to read, books of the interior world, the evening world, the world of knowing from the lick of the sun on the skin or the gold green of the needles on the trees that summer was coming, a change in the world that for me had meant always a moment, a moment only, of every thought and feeling slowly filling up and opening, spreading, touching almost all that I wanted to, again like a flower, filling and coloring very nearly to that brim of me, that point in me, that state in which I truly felt I could do and feel and say all that winter and darkness had kept for me, a fullness as in music. But as every note, even the note that sustains for minutes and minutes in the vibrating air of an empty concert hall must die and every flower fall, and every full thing come to its point of collapse. So too must the feeling of a night in May as I listened to Hiroshi Yoshimura's wetland and the hummingbird face shifted in and out of my vision, its movements the same as a cursor on a screen, moving so imperceptibly quickly from one point to another, resting there for a moment like a pause in a sentence, and shifting again. Books of that feeling. But 
on the evenings when I chased that feeling through the pages of a rhythmic book at the end of a day that had worn at me, I would start without wanting to sleep. I would read the sentence again. Perhaps I would manage to read another sentence after, perhaps another, and I would sleep and I would wake up. And the line I had read last would look like a stranger to whom I knew I nevertheless owed some special obligation as if from another life. And I would read it and sleep. And now I would dream, a very compressed dream, fullness in a small space, like an immensity written in tiny text on a scrap of paper, like Robert Valser's pencil zone, a full story, a completely realized landscape. But I would wake up immediately and forget. I would hold a vapor of a picture of a souvenir from my dream, a comb made from tortoise shell, a room with no windows and green painted steel, the mouth of a whale in the deep sea. And I would forget. I would look again at strange lines, read and reread and sleep and wake up. A time would come when I would forget to try to read, would merely sleep and dream and wake up and repeat. Perhaps remembering for a second I was holding a book before sleeping again. And then I would forget to wake up for almost 40 minutes. And when I woke up, it would be dark and my mouth would be dry. And I would have forgotten where I, where I was and who I was. So that even in moments of calm and repose with my rhythmic kindred books, forgetfulness would find me again and always. I was a marked man for forgetfulness, a bounty a small fish with no school in the deep sea. Thinking about forgetting, I forgot the park. I forgot the frame. I forgot I had been wearing white pants and sitting on the grass. I forgot the house I rented with its one story and four rooms. I forgot it was night. The present and its sensations and imperatives slid from me like snow melt without a sound. I was in reverie. I was inside. I was on the invisible brass causeway in the darkness between the park and wherever it is I am now. They had always existed at the same time, the parallel worlds. To bridge them in the darkness of the space between, I had to forget so much. The invisible brass causeway was a structure actuated by forgetfulness, dreamed from a blueprint of forgetfulness that burned away after use with a cold flame like creosote, a forgetting of a special kind. Not the forgetting of sleep or the forgetting of the days of the blossom, the forgetting that came to me from outside and hunted me. A new forgetting I had to learn inside, to remember how to do, forgetting all that plagued me from the inner sea and the land outside, forgetting the skin of ice in my broken brain, forgetting like the bird who flies because it has forgotten how not to. I had to forget how not to be alive. It was one of the hardest things I had ever done. I did not know how long I could, would manage to do it, to keep the invisible bridge of brass trembling between worlds in the darkness. But I knew that as long as I felt the sliding in place of one word after another in inevitability, sliding as if in a wooden game, I would be walking the bridge and not falling, forgetting and mothering into being the commerce of two worlds. I knew now one thing I could say without doubts. I was not only thinking wherever it is I am now and not quite speaking, but writing. I was feeling the slide into place of word after wooden word. I do not say wooden simply to reintroduce my metaphor. I knew they were wooden words that I spoke the language of a man made of wood with a stick out his back, bucking and kicking on a flexible board while a folklorist sang badly. I wrote in the language of a wooden man bucking and kicking to the tune of the materialist determinants of, determinants of history. Venaria, the rodeo, me being strictly neutral, the rising of the moon. The captain's name was Ned, and he died for a maid. Someday I would even forget language itself, would be a wordless mannequin, would be, in effect, a mutilated part of a tree. 
I did not remember being a living tree. It was not that I had forgotten. I simply did not remember. I could hardly begin to imagine what it had felt like. I thought it would feel like drawing a circle. Slowly, many thousands of autonomous auxiliary processes, no more, no more known to me than my endocrine system as a man, so I say, is known to me, or the mites in my eyebrows, but all nevertheless true and working, all coming together so that I in my peace and my silence could draw another circle over the span of a year. Perhaps as far as the autonomous processes were concerned, my drawing a circle was merely a banal mathematical inevitability, an eccentric byproduct of the mighty and important things they did. Perhaps. But all of this could be wrong. I did not remember. I was no longer a tree, but a wooden man. I say man, force of habit. The truth is I really don't care. A wooden man with an endocrine system and no memory of being a tree, but a longing so strange for that time. I could have been water or wind or a stone before that. In fact, I was sure of it. I felt more like water or wind or a stone or a tree than a wooden man. And yet here I was. The stick at my back was held tight in the folklorist's sweaty hand. And in thinking of this, I had forgotten to forget. I fell through the absence that had once been an invisible bridge of brass. Thanks.